Hello and welcome to the Legacy Project, which is an oral history of California appellate court justices. I am Patricia Bamatri Manukian, and I am honored to be interviewing my dear friend and colleague, <laughs> Justice Nathan Mihara. We have served together on the Municipal Court, the Superior Court, and the Court of Appeal, and we have been friends for many years. So Justice Mihara, let's begin by talking about your family, your parents, your siblings, your relatives, uh, their life experiences and um, occupations. Okay, so that'll take two hours. Uh, <laughs> Justice Mnookin, it's so great that you're doing this interview because uh, we are good friends and you know more about me than I do. So if I say something wrong or you need to correct me, feel free, okay? Thank you. As always, you were never reluctant to correct me in the Court of Appeal, I'm sure. <laughs> You'll feel free to do it now. <laughs> anyway, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, family. Um, yes, uh, grandparents uh, immigrated uh, both sides. Uh, mother and father's uh, parents immigrated from Japan uh, around the uh, turn of the century, the 1900s, um, through Hawaii and then San Francisco. Uh, my mom's uh, family uh, were vegetable farmers in uh, Los Osos near San Luis Obispo. My father's father uh, had a barber shop in uh, San Francisco on, uh, uh, I think it was Fillmore. And uh, yeah, uh, they were the, the first <laughs> of the family to be here. My dad was born in San Francisco. My mom was one of eight children, uh, seven girls and a boy, uh, living on a farm in San Luis. So um, yeah, that's their background. Uh, they actually met in uh, Manzanar, which was an internment camp for Japanese Americans uh, right after World War II broke out. Uh, um, over 100,000 uh, Japanese uh, um, uh, U.S. citizens and also uh, Japanese uh, uh, who were not citizens, non-citizens non of the United States um, were incarcerated there. And, and that was actually where my parents met. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Manzanar. It's, it's in Owens Valley. Do you know where that is? North of L.A.? Yeah. Um, and they met there, so in a way, it was uh, it was a blessing for me that they met. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> Someone would be interviewing you, <laughs> but I wouldn't be here. Um, so, yeah, uh, they they were married in Chicago at a Presbyterian church. There, it was a small wedding, um, and then uh, after the war um, was over, I should add that my father worked for uh, U.S. Army Intelligence uh, Service uh, (MIS), and. Uh, he was an interpreter uh, during the war, and he uh, he interpreted uh, obviously Japanese and English and vice versa. But he also uh, taught Chinese. He learned that on his own, uh, probably stemming from a lot of his uh, Chinese friends uh, in San Francisco when he was growing up. And anyway, uh, uh, he was in the U.S. Army, but the Navy tapped him to be the official uh, interpreter uh, for the Japanese surrender in northern Japan. The famous one, as you know, was on the battleship Missouri in, in Tokyo Bay. Uh, but my dad was actually uh, in, in one of the interpreters, I'm sure there are many, um, in the uh, Northern Surrender. So, and there are actually photographs of him. I, when I was a kid, I thought, yeah, sure, Dad. Mm, okay, you did that. But there are actually photographs of him uh, interpreting for the United States forces um, you know, with these uh, Japanese <laughs> military officers. It's the oddest thing. They're probably wondering, who is this guy? You know. <laughs> What is he? Who is he? Where is he from? <laughs> anyway, um, one of the interesting things is about my family too. You know, um, lately I've been interested in family tree and history. And uh, I remember my father telling me that his family is from Hiroshima, and he went back, to, of course, to find family records, and there were none. They were all gone. They were destroyed. Uh, my mother's from Kyushu, uh, and her, you know she has a better record of, of her family and so forth. Anyway. So while uh, after the war was over and the U.S. forces were occupying Japan, uh, General MacArthur's headquarters uh, was in the uh, Daiichi building called the Diet Building in downtown Tokyo. And um, my mother uh, and my father, my father was stationed in Tokyo uh, as an um, kind of undercover uh, to figure out what was going on. They were concerned about communist influence and so forth. So uh, my dad was stationed in Tokyo, kind of undercover, I think. Uh, but my mom uh, wanted to work, and so she ended up working as a secretary for General MacArthur's staff. Uh, some of the uh, lieutenants there on the uh, second floor, third floor. And she would tell me these great stories about how the general would come to work, um, you know, uh, draped in his uh, long overcoat and his, uh, his pipe, 
And uh, the entire staff would stand at attention, including secretarial staff. And the women would be wearing white gloves, standing at attention as the general would pass by. She said it was, it was like looking at a, a Hollywood star, you know, kind of a thing. It was very interesting. Uh, I actually went back to the Diet Building um, several years ago when my wife and I were in Japan. So anyway, long story short, long story longer, I, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we're going to be here all day, right, David? Is that and Our cameraman there is just working very, very hard. Thumbs up. <laughs> and, uh, and Chris is over there taking notes, which I appreciate. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is, so I was, that's why I was born in Tokyo, because that's where they were. So okay. you were born on May 11th, 1950. Yes. In yeah, Tokyo. A closely guarded secret. But my father was so, <laughs> I know, David, that was funny. Uh, you know, the interesting thing about that is my father was so paranoid because of the internment. U.S. citizens being incarcerated for the color of their skin, basically, they're Japanese. And so, an interesting story my dad told me, it was interesting. He said that he got a job, uh, he followed my mom to Chicago and her sister, who were working as, uh, uh, they are working in a, I think they were working in a, um, a church, actually, a Christian church there. Um, they got room and board, and they were doing some things, they were helping out, and, and that's where my parents got married, but... Um, my dad got a job at a uh, steel factory, not too far away, and because they thought he was Chinese. <laughs> and once they figured out he wasn't, they fired him. And so I asked dad, so what did you do? You lost your job, you know, probably a pretty good job. He goes, yeah, uh, Uncle George, your Uncle George helped me get a job where he was working at a Baby Ruth factory, you know, the candy bar. So I thought to myself, ah, that's where I get my sweet tooth. I figured it out. From Baby Ruth. Baby Ruth. Yeah. Today, one of my favorite candy bars, honestly. Yeah, truly. Very sentimental. Uh, but in any event, so I was born in Tokyo. Uh, we lived there for several years. Um, and uh, it's interesting because while I was there, my parents told me that I, I spoke really perfect Japanese for a little guy. And when I came back to the United States, my grandparents were astonished. <laughs> at my Japanese, and I've forgotten a lot, but to this day, uh, when I was back in Japan, I could actually converse, say some things anyway, and uh, so that was good. How so, old were you when you came back to oh, the United States? Oh, probably three, three and a half, something like that. Uh, uh, my mom and I took a ship back, and we landed in, uh, um, in Seattle, actually, and ironically, that's where I went to college, the University of Washington, and, you know, it was no... Uh, it wasn't a coincidence that that happened because my father told me about the university because he was there, obviously, and he said, you know, that's such a lovely campus. He, you know, my father never went to college, so he was just talking about the campus, these beautiful neo-Gothic buildings, and, and he said, you should check that out. So I did. He, he bought me a plane ticket, and I went up there and uh, fell in love with Seattle, and, and that's, that's one of the reasons I went there. I think that was one of your questions. Why did I end up in Washington? So in my childhood... As you can imagine, being uh, a child of a, a United States uh, Army um, uh, officer, uh, we traveled a lot, you know. So we were in Japan, uh, then we're, I think we were in um, Presidio just for a little bit in San Francisco. Uh, I remember being there, and then uh, settled in Monterey. That's where Dad was teaching at the U uh, Army Navy Language School. Uh, when I was in the Superior Court, I was invited by the Court Interpreters Association to come down and speak uh, during the AT&T uh, golf tournament that was going on there. They, they were having their own convention uh, for, court, uh, for interpreters uh, that were working for AT&T. And uh, they asked me to speak. And uh, it was so nostalgic for me in a way because here I was just a couple of blocks from where my dad was teaching, Chinese and Japanese to all these military personnel. And here I was lecturing <laughs> to all these wonderful interpreters, you know, uh, in, in Monterey there. And I thought, God. That was that was kind of chilling, really, <laughs> but a good a, a good thing a good thing. Uh, so yeah, I was there. We were there. We uh, and then we uh, settled in uh, to uh, uh, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, Fort Holabird, is where the uh, uh, U.S. Military Intelligence Headquarters uh, happened to be, or, or training facility, and then also uh, Chicago. That was Fifth Army Headquarters. Uh, we moved to Hawaii uh, in 1958. 59, I was eight or nine years old, and uh, so I spent some, some of my youth in uh, two blocks from Waikiki Beach <laughs> for a little bit, and then we moved to the uh, 
uh, it's called the windward side, Kailua, which is now a bustling, uh, as I understand it, uh, 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 a tourist attraction and so forth. And back in those days, you know, we lived in a tiny little cottage. You know, uh, there are there are dead frogs all over the place, and there was a swamp in the backyard with uh, cows and roaming around free. And um, um, my elementary school was a, a Quonset hut, <laughs> basically, and uh, just on the outskirts of downtown. I used to walk to school, uh, that kind of thing. Um, interesting story there. Years later, I'm talking with Howard Holm, who's a now a retired Superior Court judge out of LA, and Howard's Korean, actually. And he actually lived in Hawaii. Uh, he's a little older than I am. So we were talking about this uh, elementary school teacher, Mrs. Fernandez, all the boys had a crush on. She was just lovely, lovely. Uh, lady. And he said, I had her. Howard, you had Mrs. Fernandez? He goes, yeah. So it's funny, uh, at these judicial conferences and the Asian Pacific uh, Judges Association events, you meet people and you start talking about your lives. And, and if you've lived for a while on this planet, you have these connections. And it's just astonishing, you know, to me. And, uh, and so, of, co of course, we have this bond now <laughs> that we're, we both had a crush on the <laughs> safety, safety we, we had. Or anyway, so uh, after that, um, uh, we moved back to Japan. And Dad spent his final three years in the U United States Army. Uh, he spent 22 years in the service in Tokyo. And we actually went back to where I was born uh, in a place called Washington Heights. It was military-dependent housing. And uh, Dad you know, was doing his thing uh, in Army intelligence. Uh, Mom, at that point, had three children, and you know what it's like to have three children. <laughs> of course, you know, her children were not as really cool and well-behaved and marvelous as your children, so I, I really felt sorry for my mom. Um, I had to chase us around. Um, she was yeah. busy. Tell us about your siblings. Oh, okay. Well, uh, my, my sister was born in Baltimore uh, at John Hopkins, and she was delightful. She was just so, she was pretty, and she was funny. And, um, and uh, yeah, she, uh, I was so glad at age seven to get a sibling, you know, it was really wonderful. And uh, so, but we were seven years apart, so it was like having two separate families in a way. And then I remember going to college and coming back, uh, we had this bond, you know, and uh, it was, it, her name was Diane. And uh, she, was, she was just marvelous, I, I, I really, and, and you know, when kids are growing up, especially in junior high and high school, they tend to try to distance themselves from their parents, right? And so I'd come home, and I'd ask Diane to sit with me to watch a t TV program or a movie or something, and my mother was astonished. She did what you said? I said, well, yeah, she's my sister, you know? <laughs> I spent time with her, she couldn't believe it, you know? <laughs> so, in any event, um, yeah, Diane unfortunately passed away uh, when I was in Superior Court, I was member. I was uh, uh, at Superior Court Review, then a settlement calendar, and uh, HOJ. You remember that calendar, I Hall do. of Justice, <laughs> and uh, yeah, they pulled me off out of family court to do that. I remember that, and uh, I got the word that my sister was missing, and so um, uh, she she died in a tragic accident, you know, and so um, I miss her, but. Uh, some fond memories. Interestingly, uh, this was in, uh, this is fascinating. I, I didn't know much about what she was doing exactly. I knew she was helping my dad, who was recovering from a stroke. She was single uh, and uh, uh, living at home, helping my folks. And a public defender came to me several months after she passed away, and she said, "You know, Judge, is your sister's name Diane?" I said, "Yes. How'd you know?" Well, we kind of knew her because um, she would come to uh, homeless shelters. And she would bring uh, stuffed animals for the little ones. I thought, my sister did that. <laughs> you know, I was wondering why she, why she had so many stuffed animals around all the time. She was taking them uh, to distribute and, and little goodies and things like that to the homeless people. Uh, and then Palo Alto, I think, and Santa Clara Valley. So I learned something of my sister from a contact in the public defender's office. That's how weird this profession is in, in life, right? Yeah, so I'm grateful to that public defender for sharing that with me. So, and then I have a brother, and he was born in Hawaii, uh, in Honolulu, uh, Triple Army Hospital, the Pink Hospital on the Hill. And and Ted is, uh, he, he's very different uh, than I. He's, um, he's more entrepreneurial. You know, in our family, we have um, sort of the artistic side of the family, and we have the business side of the family. Well. Ted falls into the business side of the family uh, in terms of his genes and, uh, and makeup. Uh, I remember when he was 10, he'd be out there um, buying an old bike, 
fixing it up and selling it for a profit and going up buying a new stereo set for himself. I mean, he was like that, you know. And, and it didn't surprise me after he graduated from UCLA. Justin Manukin, by the way, is a UCLA Bruin, everybody. I just want you to know that. Nick, you probably know that because of all the paraphernalia in her, her office, right? Yeah. If you can't figure out that she's a Bruin by going into her office, then you're either blind or you just don't care. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, uh, after he graduated from UCLA, he, he was thinking about law. I told him I'd support him, but he said, you know, I'm going to do something else. And he went into software sales. And oh my gosh, uh, he is he's a star. He really is. He's so good at it. And he's in such demand. Uh, for some reason, he's uh, 60 years old. He's 10 years younger than I am. But everybody thinks he's 35. <laughs> so he gets away with it. He says, he goes, Nate, this is amazing. He says, I'm still working in sales and I'm, I'm 60 and, and, and nobody is 60 in sales and software. Nobody. <laughs> he says, I'm like a grandfather of these kids, you know, and so, but he's, he's wonderful. And he lives in Halfham Bay with his wife. Uh, I am privileged to have uh, a niece, Annika, who's just started at Pepperdine University. I think you know where that is. I in, do. In Malibu, right? And uh, yeah, she is just wonderful. I, I love Annika. Uh, Ted's a golfer, so can you guess where she got her name? Annika Sorenstam, the professional, yeah. See, now, yeah, there you go. David understands these things, you know. I mean, if you're not a golfer, you know, I remember, yeah. Your husband's not a golfer, right, Pete? Superior Court Judge, He's Pete not. Manukian. He's not a golfer. I remember I went to my first golf tournament, and I had, I had had six lessons playing golf at Stanford. And I remember, I think, either I was talking to Pete, or you were telling me this, that, uh, he wanted to go to this golf tournament. He says, Pete, you don't play golf. He says, well, can I go for the food? <laughs> and I just thought that was great because I thought, I was thinking the same thing. I play golf, but not well, so maybe I'll just go for the food. You know, let's just have some prime rib and yuck it up with the other judges. And, you know, anyway, why are you going to find that? I have no idea. I have no idea. So um, how did you and when did you move back to California? Oh, okay. So dad retired in 1964. And we just missed the Summer Olympics in Tokyo, believe it or not. It was then. And, uh, and so we moved back to California. Dad was trying to find a job. And it was tough, you know, being a retired military because, um, you know, he didn't go to college. He had some college credits, I think, from Glendale and University of Maryland, that sort of thing. But he didn't have a degree. And so he was kind of wondering what he should do with himself. He finally found work in Los Angeles. And my mother refused to move to L.A. <laughs> so my dad actually commuted. Um, to San Luis Obispo, where, where my mom's parents were uh, from LA. He was staying with my cousin Jerry in Glendale or Pasadena or somewhere. And he was working for TWA at the airline. So that's what we did for that first year. And that's where I spent my first year in high school, San Luis Obispo. Great experience. I was living on a farm. You know, it was country life. Uh, great high school, great teachers. Um, and then did you have some jobs down there during your first year uh, of high yeah. school? Yeah. Um, that's where I actually worked and got paid for it. Uh, my, my uncle, I think, just to keep me out of trouble, uh, had me um, weeding with a hoe and, these, and it's acres and acres of uh, uh, vegetable fields. You know, uh, they had uh, romaine, lettuce, iceberg lettuce, which actually, iceberg lettuce was introduced in that area by my grandfather, you know, who was a farmer, um, and very well known in the community, community leader. Um, and so he, uh, so yeah, I did that. I mowed lawns. Uh, I I, uh, I loaded up uh, big trucks full of uh, celery and romaine and lettuce, and to be shipped off to L.A. for uh, the, the wholesale food markets down there. Um, later on, um, I stuck with that type of industry when I was in high school. I worked for my uncle Shimmy at Mount Eden uh, Floral Supplies and uh, and wholesale shipping. So I drove trucks for them to San Francisco to the market. I, my, I didn't sort the flowers, but I packed them for shipment um, so, and did odd jobs, that sort of thing. Some carpentry work. So I was kind of a jack of all trades, yeah. So when did you move to the Bay Area? Um, well, after, after high school, my dad, my dad was a really bright, sharp, amazing man. He, uh, he was told by my uncle Shimmy, who was living in Atherton at the time with his family, that uh, there was an opening for a stockbroker uh, position in, uh, for J. Barth Company in Miller Park. And they would take you and train you. 
so my dad was hired. Uh, he was trained to be a stockbroker by this company. He took the brokerage exam, and not surprising to me, although it was kind of a little startling, I guess, uh, he scored the highest uh, score ever in the history of the company on that exam. And uh, he was successful at it until, uh, of course, the recession hit and that sort of thing. And boy, all the wheels came off for all those brokerage companies, and my dad included. So my mom went to work uh, at Stanford Research Institute as a secretary. But I, I remember those years were really hard. And, um, and that's around the time I was in high school. Went to Mountain View High School. And um, yeah, I was, um, it was interesting. I, I was sharing this the other day. I normally don't mention this, but I, I was asked to uh, give a commencement speech at the University of Santa Clara uh, Law School for their specialty uh, clinic, um, uh, graduates, uh, social justice uh, uh, center graduates. And I was, I was explaining to the person who asked me, I said, you know, I haven't spoken at a commencement since I was valedictorian at my high school class. <laughs> Back in 1968, so that brought back some memories. Um, yeah, I played football and uh, varsity football. I was called the tennis shoe tackle because my family was so poor. Uh, they didn't think my dad didn't think he could afford the cleats. So we had this deal: if I made the team, he would get me cleats. <laughs> so I made the team. I got cleats, but I was I was in tennis shoes <laughs> during tryouts and practices, and and the coaches were were looking at me like, what's wrong with this kid? <laughs> you know, he's big. He's mean, he's ugly, he's kind of slow, lumbering, but we like him, so I made the cut. And so I was known from, henceforth as the tennis shoe tackle of Mountain View High School. And I played against your husband. You did. He mentions it all the time. He talks about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you won. I think Mountain yeah, we, you won. We won that beat game. Los Altos. Yeah, we beat Los Altos. It was just one of those quirky things, you know. <laughs> so interesting that your paths crossed when you were... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In high school together. In high school. It's so weird. Yeah, so did you develop an interest in going, uh, in, you know, attending uh, college up in Washington at that time? Or how did you end up going to the University of Washington? Well, I think when I was looking at colleges, you know, I was looking at Cal. I was looking at, um, I don't know if I was looking at Southern Cal at that point. Um, but I was looking at um, the Cal schools and I was looking uh, at Oregon and Washington. And the reason why I was looking at Oregon and Washington is because I just want to get away from home and, and, and spread my wings a little bit. You know, I love my parents, I love my family, but I thought it'd be good for me to kind of jump out of the nest. And so, I, but I wanted to stay on the West Coast, so that's why I was looking at those schools. And my dad, as you, as I said it earlier, you know, told me about the university. So, uh, yeah, I fell in love with the campus, and the people were great. Uh, ran into this oceanography graduate student who gave me this kitchen tour of the place, and so. Um, that's why I went there. The other reason I went there is because it was a conservative campus. Uh, they had an ROTC program. I was on an ROTC scholarship um, that was awarded to me uh, my senior year in high school. And so I was going to spend, they were going to pay for my uh, college education. Then I would give them four years of service as an officer. And so that was my game plan. And it was the United States Army. And uh, that's the other reason because I thought if I go to Berkeley, this is the 60s, right? I'm not sure I would survive, <laughs> was my theory, you know, uh, free speech movement. I mean, I, I was sympathetic, you know, uh, anti-Vietnam protests and so forth, but I thought to myself, well, you know, I could go, end up going to Vietnam or something like that, but, I, but that would be another layer of pressure, I think, other than just the academics, you know, so that's why I went to Washington. Uh, and what did you major in? I majored in uh, economics. Why economics? Uh, because my plan was to get an MBA, uh, graduate school of business there in, in, in Seattle. And I thought it was a good uh, um, hub for east-west trade. And I had family in Japan. I call them family, but they were just super close friends of my family's. And they're all in business. And I thought, okay, uh, this would be great to be able to work with them and get involved in that direction. That was my thinking. Um, so yeah. your plan was to get an MBA? Serve four years in the army right. and then become a businessman. Right, exactly. Go into business. And what did you actually do? Uh, ultimately, <laughs> well, um, yeah, I went into veterinary medicine for a while. That was awful. No, I'm just teasing. That's not true. <laughs> Chris is going. Don't don't say that. I said okay. Well. <laughs> it's okay, Chris. That was a joke, and uh, this is not going to be edited. So I, I realize. That. 
<laughs> oh man, I'm so sorry. Um, are the two hours up yet? Are we done yet? Or we have to keep going. We have a long way to go. Oh man, <laughs> David, you just have to turn off the camera if you get bored, right? Just, just, just give me this. Going, we we'll stop it. <laughs> okay. Um, the question was, what ultimately happened? Well, I was accepted to business school. I was ready to go. Um, uh, let me back up for a minute. What happened with the military issue, uh, or not issue, but my future there was cut short because I was in a head-on collision in college, and I was thrown from the car, ended up in a ditch. It was like a bad movie, you know, where the, the car, you know, massive accident, and, and you know, the people are thrown into ditches, and, and there's, there's farmhouses in the distance, and people come running out to help you. Well, it kind of happened to me. Uh, there are six of us in the car. We all managed to get to this farmhouse, and the wonderful family at the northern uh, north of Seattle uh, at a farm farmland up there. there. They helped us and uh, I spent some time in the, in, uh, in the infirmary at the university and they checked me out, felt I was okay. But um, I started feeling very sick after that and uh, it was concerning uh, to me and I went to um, uh, army doctors in Fort Lewis and they said, you know, uh, we're going to give you an honorable medical discharge. And so that ended my military career. Um, fortunately, they didn't make me pay back <laughs> the money they spent on my tuition and lab fees and that sort of thing, and, uh, which I was grateful for. Uh, and um, Captain Sousa at the time was one of my heroes and one of my mentors in college told me, he said, you know, we're not going to do that. And, uh, at that point, I was uh, number two in my class, my OTC class, so they knew I was on a malingerer or something like that. I, I was serious about what I was doing. So. Uh, so that was, that, was, that was a real blessing. I, I'm thankful to the Army for doing that for me. Um, so then in my uh, military career, um, and so I was concentrated on business school, and my friend Irene Fujitomi, who's a dear friend, who's a, one of those Phi Beta Kappa, PhD, brilliant type people, um, said, you know, you should go to law school. I said, Irene, you're nuts. I, <laughs> what do I know about law? And the lawyers that I probably will meet, I won't like. <laughs> I'm not sure I said that, but um, but that was my feeling. I, my experience in law up to that point was what Perry Mason, and this great program. I don't know if you remember. I called the Defenders with yes. E.J. Marshall, right? Robert Reed. I'll never forget the, that series. I, I I was just captivated by it. But it didn't it didn't excite me about the law. It was just interesting to me and it exposed me to that. Uh, the other thing that uh, was helpful to me in terms of making this decision to apply to law school was that. Uh, my first year at Washington, my first Thanksgiving, I, I, my mom wanted me to come home, and I said, well, a friend of mine um, invited me to his house in southern Washington for Thanksgiving, and so I'm going to do that and save you folks some money on airfare. Well, <laughs> mom was not happy about that, as you can imagine. But uh, the, my friend's father was a lawyer, he was a litigator, a PI lawyer down in uh, Vancouver, Washington. and. Uh, the day after Thanksgiving, he asked Alan and his son and I, do you want to see a deposition? I said, what's that? He goes, you'll find out. <laughs> and so we watched this deposition. It was an auto accident. And interestingly enough, uh, the husband uh, is uh, deposed first and says, well, you know, when I was driving, this happened, this happened, this happened. Then his wife is being deposed. And she says, well, you know, I was driving down the road here. And so I'm thinking, so who was driving? <laughs> you know? It, that was really interesting to me. But again, it, it didn't pique my interest in law. I had, still had no desire to go to law school. I just thought it was interesting. But when Irene talked to me um, at the university, she said, you know, you have all the tools. You have the gifts and um, the skill set and so forth. And, and I was a little irritated with that because my plans were set. And I thought, oh, okay. I don't want to talk to you about this anymore. I'll just apply. <laughs> so I did. That's why I applied to law school. And she said, you know, uh, Hastings is, is a great place. And so I applied to Hastings. I applied to Bolt. applied to Santa Clara. Apparently, I was too late. Uh, my application was too late for Bolt. But then uh, Santa Clara put me on a wait list, <laughs> interestingly enough. And I got into Hastings. So um, uh, the joke I tell my students is that there's probably some guy named Nathan Mihara from Jacksonville, Florida, who had straight A's in college, is brilliant, had wonderful LSATs, and he can't figure out, why the heck did I not get into Hastings? Well, I'm just making that up just for fun. I just, it usually gets a big charge out of my, 
on my out of my students. But in any event, uh, it was a it was a good experience. Uh, I can't say I loved it. You know, it was hard. And the reason why it was hard for me, I think, is because um, I did well my my first semester. I remember that. And um, I was telling my friends, I said, you know, I need to work. You know, my dad's barely making anything. My mom's working as a secretary, put food on the table for three of us. I was living at home. Uh, you know, I just have to get a job. And so um, through a variety of connections, I got a job at a bankruptcy law firm, Dinkelspiel and the Dinkelspiel, which is now defunct, but uh, downtown financial district. And I worked for them for that, um, uh, let's see, my second semester in law school and for the summer and uh, made some good money. I, I didn't realize that lawyers could make that kind of money. And, I, and here I am, a law clerk, and I get a Christmas bonus? I mean, how did that happen? You know, uh, and that sort of thing. So it opened my eyes a little bit to the financial rewards. But to be honest with you, um, when I left that firm, I finished up my term there, I, um, I didn't want to go that route. Um, partly because um, I didn't, wasn't sure I'd fit into the lifestyle. You know, uh, these folks would go out to the Leopard Bar and Lounge, you know, on Battery, wherever it was on Pine Street, and have drinks and play liar's dice and eat hors d'oeuvres. And I'd be sitting there with my 7-Up, you know, and I'm thinking, well, I, want to, I just want to go home, you know. <laughs> so, um, but it was very nice. I mean, they treated me really well. I'm so thankful. I got a taste of, of what, you know, uh, senior partners in law firms, how their lifestyles. They, one of them owned a mansion up on Pacific Heights, and I got to hobnob with them and see what it's like to sit at a table with servants running around. And it was just a different lifestyle, you know. And um, it's not that I objected to it. I mean, I was I was happy that there are people who can do that and enjoy it, but it wasn't for me. So um, after I graduated from law school, I thought to myself, well, um, I'm not sure what I want to do. Yeah. So. Um, but what happened was, I, uh, my next summer, of uh, my 2L year, I worked for um, the Attorney General's Office in San Francisco. And, um, and this is the day, in the days where there was no internet, right? Everything was on, on cork boards in the hallway <laughs> with thumbtacks, you know? <laughs> and one of my says, hey, look at that. And I thought, oh, okay. And I did well in criminal law, and I thought, well, it was a criminal division. So I, I applied, and I got the job. There were about a dozen of us from throughout the Bay Area you know, Berkeley, Stanford, you know, wherever, and, and we're all writing appellate briefs, interestingly enough. That was between your second and third year of mm -hmm. law school. Mm -hmm. And I liked it. I liked, I liked the work. I liked the people a lot. Um, and, I, and so I applied after, after graduation, but I, uh, just before graduation, but I didn't get the job. And I thought, okay, that's, that's all right. You know, I'll find something. And then... Um, after I passed the bar, I remember uh, coming out of church, and this friend of mine says, "Hey Nate, you got a Are you a lawyer yet?" I said, "Yeah." Where are you working? I said, "Well, I'm um, not really working as a lawyer at this point." Because, "Well, are you looking?" I said, "Well, kind of." And I was kind of nonchalant about it. I don't know what was the. I was just trying to find my way, I think. And he says, "Well, talk to uh, John Miller, also known as Larry Miller in Mellow Park. He's." He converted a house with his friend Bob Day and, uh, and uh, into a law, law office, uh, and maybe he could help you. And so, um, I, so I talked to him. He was so excited to meet me. Um, he's a wonderful man, uh, family. And, and he says, well, I got a vacant office right next door to me, uh, basically a converted bedroom. He says, all you need to do is hook up your phone, and for, I can't remember, 250 a month or something, uh, you'll get a receptionist, uh, use of the library you know, all that copy machine. I said, I'm in. And so that's what I did. Um, I worked as a private attorney uh, doing civil cases. What and kinds of cases did you work on? Oh, anything that came in the door. I did wills. I, uh, I represented people who were in contract disputes. You know, um, I, did, I did one divorce. Uh, there was one, one couple, one guy that came in wanted a divorce. And after he told me the story, I said, you don't want a divorce. He goes, I don't. I said, I don't think so, the way you're talking about your wife. You've been married a year, and you're going to pull the plug. I said, does your wife have a lawyer? No. I said, okay. So, um, she won't, does she know about this? Yeah. Well, will she talk to me? Yeah. I said, well, bring her in. <laughs> so they came in, and I met with them for a long time, week after week. It was Tuesday afternoons or something, and... Uh, I just, I, I'm not a counselor or anything. I just wanted to know where their heads were, you know. So 
uh, after a while, I said, so you guys have a decision to make. If you want a divorce, I'll do the divorce. But if you want, that's cool. I'm, I'm happy about that too. So I'll eat my bologna sandwich and my Diet Coke here on the porch. <laughs> and then you come out and you tell me what you want to do. Well, they came out and they're lovey-dovey, hand in hand, and they're so excited. And I said, okay, I know where this is going. <laughs> and they thanked me and they left. And uh, that was a, see that kind of thing, it's really rewarding, you know. Uh, there's nothing like private practice, you know. I, uh, that personal contact, being able to help people, helping a single mom with credit problems, you know. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, I tell my students, I said, you know, everybody's worried about getting into big law or working for firms, that sort of thing. I mean, uh, it's, it's tough to be on your own in a lot of ways, you know, but I gotta tell you, there's nothing more rewarding than that. Mm -hmm. So you did that for how long, private practice? Oh, about practice. six, seven months or something like that. And then? Well, what happened was, I would have done that forever, you know, but um, what happened was I was, I was in my office and I got a phone call from the chief assistant attorney general in San Francisco of Criminal Division, Ed O'Brien, and Ed says, Nate, we hear you're doing great in Menlo Park. I said, whoa, okay, I'm not sure where that came from. And, I felt I was doing fine, but he said, you know, we're really inter still interested in you to work here. Sorry it didn't work out before, but can you come up and, and interview with us? And I was just really taken aback. I thought, oh man, I'm just getting used to this. It was, it's fun, I'm making some money, and at least paying my bills. And so um, I went up and interviewed with him, and I thought, well, uh, okay, maybe I'll try this for a year. Uh, and I talked to Larry about it in Menlo, and he said, look, we'll hold the office open for you for a year, and if you want to come back, it's always there for you. So that was a nice little safety net. So the long story short is I started working at the AG's office in, what was it, 77, 78, and I, I was there for almost nine years as a deputy AG and had a great career there. and I uh, have no regrets. You enjoyed the work at the Attorney General's oh, office. Oh, yeah, I loved it. Writing briefs and arguing in the courts of appeal. Uh, in 78, 70, 1979, right around then, uh, my boss came in and said, uh, um, what are you working on? I said, oh, I just got this decision back from uh, the Court of Appeal uh, on Encompass of Counsel. Uh, the name of the case was People versus Joseph Glenn Pope. Fairly routine case. Uh, Encompass of Counsel was, the, uh, was a Sixth Amendment claim raised on appeal. And I responded as I normally would, you know, uh, as a deputy AG, and we won the case, but the Supreme Court granted review. And so I was talking to my boss about it, I said, why would they grant review in this sort of common, relatively simple incompetence case? And he smiled at me, uh, Eric Collins was his name, he was one of my, my mentors uh, at the office, and he said, Nate, he's British, he says, oh, Nate, he says, don't you see it? It's clear as day. I said, what? They're going to change the law. They're going to change the standard of review for these cases. I said, in this case? He goes, yep, your case is it. So I expected his next words to be, so-and-so, who's a deputy four, level four is going to be handling this case. You'll carry the briefcase. This is a Supreme Court, you know, uh, case. But he didn't. And so I said, well, Who's working on this now? He says, you are. I'm working on this. I'd only been there, what, two and a half, three years. He says, I'm confident you can handle it. I said, oh my goodness gracious. So that was my first Supreme Court argument, uh, People versus Joseph Glenn Pope. Yeah, yeah. And they did change the standard. And uh, um, that was probably, if not the most, one of the most significant cases I handled in that, in that office. And uh, uh, the conviction was affirmed. And we were, the, the standard review was going to be, or the standard uh, for the Sixth Amendment review would be a, a reasonably competent attorney acting as a diligent and zealous advocate. Uh, that's exactly what we wanted. We wanted to establish a, a proper reasonableness standard. The second element, uh, of course, again, speaking as an appellate justice, uh, not appellate, uh, from an appellate point of view, was that we wanted to make sure the Supreme Court adopted a prejudice standard. Even if, even if you cross that threshold, was it prejudicial? Was there a denial of fair trial? Okay, uh, that was the element we were looking for. We didn't want them to make it a per se reversal situation, and, and they didn't. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, uh, we prevailed on that case. And uh, and then I handled the argument was going to be, you know, there's not enough here to reverse, so we're going to ask you to affirm this. Um, and to the extent there are questions, we're going to recommend that the 
the defense, in this case, filed a petition for rid of habeas corpus. Um, and then we had what was called a Pope hearing uh, in Sonoma County Superior, and I handled that hearing uh, before um, uh, Judge Rex Sater, um, who was on special assignment from Son uh, Sonoma, uh, not Sonoma, from uh, Solano County. And uh, we pre prevailed on the habeas uh, matter as well. So fond memories, fond memories of that case. A yeah. very significant case. Yes, it was at the time. Uh, 1979, that was, a, that was a watershed case in that area, yeah. So as an attorney general, did you also have the opportunity to try cases? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. Later in my career, I did. Um, it's interesting. I, I can't recall ever expressing an interest in that, but since I was in Santa Clara, um, there were a lot of cases arising out of the, um, the mental health institution, Agnew State Hospital. Uh, in Santa Clara County of inmates, and not inmates, uh, residents, who wanted to, uh, who were there involuntarily, who wanted to be released, claiming that they were no longer a danger to themselves or to others. And so I was called upon to go down and contest those. Um, and so there were civil in nature, you know, there were civil commitment proceedings, you know, not criminal. Uh, so I ended up in Superior Court, Santa Clara County, uh, probably every month. Uh, what they called the DD calendar, Development Disabled Calendar. And I got to know a lot of the judges there, and uh, uh, I had no idea that that was going to be an, uh, impactful, if you will, on my, on my judicial career. But um, yeah, I, so I, I had a lot of experience going into court that way. And I did try some other cases as well. Um, deputy DAs uh, who have kids, or DAs for that matter, who have children who get in trouble. Uh, they can't prosecute their own children, so the AG would step in, and I would, generally speaking, be asked to handle those in Monterey County. Yeah, uh, public defender becomes the DA in Mendocino. We had to step in and try those cases. Same thing happened in San Mateo when Jim Fox, who was a private uh, uh, defender, criminal defense attorney, became the DA. Um, lots of conflicts, so I, I try cases there too. So uh, that's where I cut my teeth, if you will, in the trial courts. Mm -hmm. So in the Attorney General's office, you developed appellate experience right. and trial experience. Mm -hmm. And um, how did you get interested in applying for the bench? <laughs> That's an interesting story, too. Much like my, 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 my path to becoming a lawyer, um, I love, uh, you, you remember uh, Wendy Clark Duffy, our, uh, our, our, our beloved colleague from Monterey Superior, who later became one of uh, uh, a valued member of our bench, um, she would, and she had the same path and same attitude or perspective. She said, you know, Nate, I think of myself as the accidental jurist. <laughs> no plans of becoming a judge. I didn't either. There are people, I'm sure, who dream about becoming judges. I hear that from students. I'm thinking, you know, they, and they look to me like, didn't you? No. I never dreamed of becoming a judge. Goodness sakes, who would do that? I, I thought, uh, I don't have any power. I have no political connection. I don't have any money. You know, <laughs> I'm a DAG three, you know, goodness sakes, seriously. And uh, one day, uh, one of my dearest friends, uh, John Sugiyama, uh, who's a colleague at the AG's office, invited me for lunch. We were having lunch together. And he says, you know, you really ought to apply for the bench. I said, are you nuts? He goes, no, our boss, former AG George Dugmajan had just become governor and he was making appointments and he's looking for qualified people. He said, you'd be great. I said, <laughs> and this is a true story, I basically said to him, that's very nice of you. Would you pass the soy sauce? <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know I, that was my level of interest. I, I could care less, you know, uh, and I had no idea what the process was like either. But he would keep bugging me about it, just like Irene uh, in Seattle. I said, okay, okay, tell me what the, what's the process. So explain the process to me. Our dear friend Frank Elia had just been appointed municipal court, Santa Clara County. He says, give Frank a call. I said, oh, I don't know. Okay, I will. So I give uh, Justice Elia a call, <laughs> and he is mad. <laughs> he goes, Nate Mihara, because Frank and I were, were uh, neighbors at the AG's office, you know. Uh, his, uh, his office was just fully well appointed, you know, beautiful carpeting and stuff on them prints on the wall. You know, I, I had a couple of Kmart prints, you know, that I found for 10 bucks <laughs> ragging on my wall. I had a plastic yellow flowered candy dish. I mean, that kind of thing. I had a 
had a shag green carpet that was probably 80 years old. I mean, I didn't care about, you know, I mean, I, I just love, but Frank as a neighbor was wonderful, having someone who, who actually knew how to, you know, um, uh, be a good host, you know, so to speak. Anyway, I called him and he was, he says, I, he says, doggone it, Mihara, you know, it's about time. I said, what? It's about time you applied. All of us were wondering when you were going to apply. <laughs> I thought, again, it was such a surprise to me. All this was a surprise to me. And so he filled me on on how to go about getting the application. He said, don't be like so many others, getting all these endorsements from uh, politicians, your local Congress people, people in state Senate and assembly. Don't do that. He says, find people, uh, judges, lawyers who you know, who know your work, who know you personally, uh, who will write letters for you. And get five. I was so relieved to hear that. And I said, okay, I could do that. And so um, the process was actually kind of enjoyable because even though it was daunting, because the application was so long and involved and it was tedious, um, I knew a lot of appellate justices because I would take the SP, uh, Southern Pacific train in the morning to commute to San Francisco from Sunnyvale. I was married at the time. And I still am married, what am I saying? <laughs> and they would ask, so how's your wife? How's your kid? I go, oh, they're doing great. They're going. And so we had this personal relationship as well as professional. You know, I mean, they knew me personally and they knew my work. And then so when I, I would call, I called them and they were just so thrilled to write for me. And I remember at my interview, my Judicial Nominees Evaluation Committee interview, the interviewer said to me, you know, uh, I just have to tell you that I've never seen letters like this from justices, you know. It's, they know you so well. I said, well, they do. <laughs> but again, that was just um, the hand of God, just a blessing from heaven that I got to know all these wonderful jurists who, uh, who supported me in my application. So that was, a, that was a blessing. They knew your work because as an attorney general, right. you appeared in front of them That's right, their court of in the justices. appellate court. Mm -hmm. And they knew you personally because they rode the train with you to work. Right. They realized what so a bad God's, bridge player it was. God's you know. plan for you. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I was very, uh, I was just taken aback by that whole process. I really was, Patty. I just, you know, thought, wow. It was a blessing. Mm -hmm. And your former boss, the Honorable George Duke Majin, right. one of the most wonderful men, I think, that oh. uh, we will ever know in our lifetime. Absolutely. What a great governor. Great had person. become, uh, had been elected governor. Right. So you submitted your application, you right. went through the process, uh -huh. and you were appointed to the Santa Clara County Municipal Court in 1985. Right. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about what you did in municipal court, your assignments and uh -huh. um, your sure. experiences. Sure. Um, well, uh, my assignments. The first assignment I received was uh, uh, what's called an arraignment and pretrial calendar. And uh, in those days, my gosh, we had so many cases, Patty. I think there were five of us, maybe four or five departments that handled arraignments in the mornings and pretrials in the afternoon, and then law in motion on Fridays. You know, we had uh, upwards of anywhere from 100 to 120 arraignments. Well, you know that. You and I served together in mini court in the mornings. And we had to get done before noon. I mean, you're talking like guns blazing, you know. and. And, and praying to God that everyone understands what the heck you're saying, you know. But it was really difficult, uh, physically as well as mentally tiring. Uh, and then in the afternoon, we'd do what, maybe 30, 35 pretrials. You've got a courtroom filled with people. Um, you know, of course, the DA is there, public defenders, private counsel. Sometimes there are clients there ready to take a plea. Uh, it was a madhouse. And then, of course, you have law in motion you have to prep for. So Thursday nights, you spend all night prepping for law in motion. I had that assignment for a full year, and it was a wonderful assignment. I, I really did enjoy it quite a bit. Um, I'm, you know, I was really worried uh, that I didn't have enough trial experience, I, that I didn't have enough um, uh, litigation experience to handle this. You know, I thought, well, maybe if I was a public defender or a DA, I'd be better suited for this. But actually, um, I think I, Irene was right. I think I did have the skill set. You know, I look back and I, I laugh because. Uh, one of the things that I was telling my wife, she says, how are you going to handle all those cases? I said, well, I, I was a cook. That's how I got, earned money for law school. You know, I, I was a chef, a uh, sous chef in, in Seattle. And we had to handle a lot, high volume, work very, very fast. Uh, you had to think on your feet. I said, it's, you know, it's, it's similar, not exactly identical, but similar in terms of the stress level. And in terms of ruling, making rulings and understanding what I was doing in law in motion, 
that was a natural for me because I, here I'd, I'd read countless number of pages of transcripts of judges doing the same thing. And being an appellate uh, specialist, you know, I knew the law pretty well, <laughs> especially criminal. And so I could, I could, uh, I could uh, go through the process of mentally uh, analyzing a case uh, th there in front of me and being able to articulate in a very logical and reasonable and, um, uh, manner uh, what my decisions would be and, uh, in a cascading kind of way. What I mean by that is that I'll say, well, uh, if this is true, uh, you know, and I find this to be true. This is, this is my particular ruling. Even assuming that's not the case, this is still my ruling because, you know, and without going into the details, um, that kind of thinking comes with appellate practice, with uh, practicing at that level. And so it's very comfortable t for me. I remember Lodoris Cordell, who was our PJ at the time, came to me and, and said, you know, um, I just have to ask you something. This is about three months into my job. She said, um, People say that it's like you've been on the bench for years. Where does that come from? And I explained to her why that was. And uh, it never dawned on me that would be my experience, to be honest with you. But then you, you were already there. And uh, I think you're, one of your questions uh, was going to be, did you have any mentors? And I thought, did I have a mentor? And it was you. <laughs> yeah. So you were there and you were saying, well, been there and done that. I said, okay, <laughs> help me out here. <laughs> I think we've certainly mentored each other through the years. I think through that's, the years, back that, and forth. That's and accurate. so um, mm -hmm. at some point you decided to apply for Superior Court. Right. This is before consolidation of the courts. Right. And so right. you had to go through another application process, right. another um, evaluation process, and you were appointed by the Honorable Governor George Duke Majin to mm. Superior Court in 1988. Right. So what did you do in Superior Court? Oh, Superior Court. See, I didn't want to go to Superior Court. <laughs> this, is, this is a recurring theme of mine, I, I know. <laughs> but uh, I was happy in Muni Court. I remember when I was interviewed, uh, uh, Renee Rubin, who's the attorney, interviewed me for my first Jenny uh, Commission interview. She said, if you just wait another year, you'll have 10 years, you can get apply to Super Court. Run with the big dogs. I said, I don't want to. She says, well, why not? I said, think about this, Renee. Where are you going to have the most impact on the most number of people in your community? Is it Superior Court or is it Muni Court? It's a no-brainer, you know? It's a no-brainer. And she said, wow, I've never heard that. I said, well, that was my... So that's why I enjoy Muni Court so much. So much, I want to say fun, but... Um, it was enjoyable, and I felt I was making an impact. So I didn't want to go, so I had to be convinced. <laughs> Jim Chang, Rocky Mall, all those friends of ours said, come on, there, there are openings, let's apply. And so that's why I applied. In terms of my assignments, uh, I actually took Justice Primo's seat, and he had lawn motion and short cause uh, calendar. So I was doing jury trials, maybe a court trial or two, lawn motion for sure. That was one, of, so my first son was civil. And shortly after that, I went to family court, as I recall. Yeah, 88, 89, something like that. Right? Where we worked together again. We worked together. And so we were reunited. <laughs> and you had the audacity to go to the Court of Appeal. <laughs> Where's my buddy? Where's my mentor? She's going to the Court of Appeal. <laughs> I'm on my own. You can't kick me out of the nest yet, Patty. Well, you weren't on your own for very long because then you applied to the appellate court. I did. And what motivated you to apply to the... You wanted to be with me again, right? I didn't, I didn't the, want to go to the appellate court. I just wanted you reviewing my decisions, favorably, <laughs> of course. But I, you know, I, didn't, I didn't really care to, uh, to go. And I, it never occurred to me to go to the Court of Appeal. But Dad Agliano, who was the uh, uh, presiding judge, at the time, uh, was was he going to retire or was thinking about retiring? He was encouraging me to apply, so that's why I did. And I think the thing that stuck with me is that uh, there were what six seats, right, in the Court of Appeal. He's, and he was telling me, you know, these vacancies don't come along very often. And when they do, and you have that opportunity, and you're qualified as well qualified as you are, you should seize that opportunity because it may not come around again. And that's and that was my thinking. I thought, okay, maybe this is a career move that has to be made just because of the timing of it, if it's something I want to do. The thing that was holding me back was that, is this going to be similar to what I was doing in the AG's office? 
because I'm going to miss the dynamic of the trial court, certainly, and, and the hustle and bustle. But I thought, no, no, it, it's, uh, I enjoyed that work, of course, and I, and I missed it to a certain degree. So I thought, no, I'm, I'm going to do this. So that's why I applied. So you applied, and then you were nominated by the um, Honorable Governor Wilson right. to serve on the Court of Appeal, mm -hmm. and you went through another vetting and evaluation process. Mm -hmm. How was that experience? You know, um, I'm trying to remember uh, that experience. Um, I think um, I had two evaluators for the Court of Appeal. One was Ann Ravel, who was then county council, I think. And I can't remember who the other person was at the moment, but it was at the county council's offices. And, and at that point, you know, I have to say for all my, it didn't, uh, I wasn't going to be hurt if I didn't get it. And so I had this, not an I don't care attitude, but nothing's going to bother me about this attitude toward it. And um, I, I, do, I do remember, um, In my first interview with Jenny in, in, for Muni Court, I was surprised because Renee Rubin said, well, we're going to talk about the negatives now. Um, and she, then in the next question, I, well, we're done. I said, well, what? She goes, I, what do you mean? What are the negatives? I'm glad to respond. She goes, there weren't any. Okay. So once you've had some judicial experience, <laughs> you know, under your belt. Um, so uh, in this interview, uh, after Muni Court and Superior Court experience, I remember uh, the question was, well, um, in terms of the negatives, we have one person who's saying you're pro-defense, criminal defense, but we have this other person saying you're pro-prosecution. <laughs> I, I thought, okay, I'm going to answer that. And, th and then they both started laughing and said, well, that's, that's good balance, right? And I, I thought, yes, you know. <laughs> but I, I'll never forget that. That was, that was a really, um, that's what I do remember about the interview. Otherwise, it was sort of unmemorable, I guess. Yeah. So we at the Court of Appeal, um, serving with Justice Agliano as our PJ, were very excited when you arrived because mm -hmm. you had mm -hmm. tremendous appellate experience. Mm -hmm. You had trial experience as an AG, mm -hmm. actual in-court, boots-on-the-ground experience. <laughs> yeah. You had experience in Superior Court, mm -hmm. trying jury trials, civil and criminal. Mm -hmm. You could handle huge calendars efficiently and quickly. Um, and we were excited to have somebody with your background, your intelligence, mm -hmm. your professionalism, and your dedication join us. So you were confirmed in uh -huh. uh, 1993 That's and right. joined our court. Mm -hmm. And right. what observations did you make? How did it go? How, how did you enjoy your experience? Ah, okay. That's a great question. Well, I didn't start off very well because I spilled... Uh, I, I hosted a reception uh, for the court staff, do you remember that, in this building. And um, there was some chocolate fondue or something, and I spilled it all over Kareem Pochop's dress, who was our <laughs> assistant clerk at the time. And I thought, this is not a good way to start my career here. You know? So I got off on a kind of a rocky start. Oh, actually, she's, she's delightful, and she forgave me instantly. But um, uh, seriously, though, what? I remember, um, and, and, and I remember, I'm reminded of this by Elizabeth Lowenstein, who's retired. He was, she was Justice Elia's, uh, one of his lead attorneys, I think. And she wrote in uh, my retirement book, she said, uh, she remembers when, when I was appointed, it was really quiet in my chambers, but didn't last long. <laughs> there came a time where you could hear a lot of animated talking and laughter and uh, coming from my chambers. And, and, um, and I kind of remember that. I remember coming into the job thinking, okay, um, and I talked to my staff. I heard, I heard great lawyers, uh, Ellen Zeff and Martha McGinnis, uh, my senior research attorneys. And I remember telling them, I said, you know, um, here's my philosophy, all right? And it's something that's remained true for my 27 years in the court. I said, you know, um, first, first and foremost, for the vast majority of cases, these are not going to go to the Supreme Court of California. There's no other relief in sight. This is, this is it, okay? Um, there's no review after this. So folks, we've got to get it right. That's the pressure, is that we've got to get it right, okay? 
number two, um, in terms of my responsibility to the staff, you know, um, and I tell lawyers this, and as well as my other uh, judges too, is that um, you've got to put your people in the best situation where they can do their very best work, whether it's ergonomic chairs or you know uh, some flex time maybe uh, if they've got some family situation, whatever it is, uh, give them some training or, or just talk to them about and be available to talk with them about whatever comes up. Um, you've got to put them in the best position to bring their A game. Um, and that's what I promise you. Yeah. So, and I'll never tell you to do something without a reason. There's always going to be a reason. So, uh, and I think the secret to uh, my, my uh, level of enjoyment here and um, satisfaction has to do with my staff. I had a great staff. I had a great JA, Mary Goulet, who retired after seven years, I think. 14 years, I can't remember. Um, and then Karen Bynum, of course, uh, uh, had worked for me after Mary retired. Uh, when you have a staff that's just really superb and um, detail-oriented and no stone left unturned and are willing to, to bend and to um, adjust and to be flexible and be open-minded, uh, boy, you know, I died and went to heaven. That was it. <laughs> Lord, take me home. <laughs> At least it's getting any better than this. I said the same thing when I ate a crab cake in South Carolina. Yeah, I almost fell out of my chair. I was talking to Kurt Browning, who was <laughs> the AG of, in, in, from Nebraska. I said, have you ever tasted a crab cake like this? He goes, no. And he said the same thing. <laughs> Lord, take me home. This is, this is it. I've reached the pinnacle. <laughs> That's a true story, by the way. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> We're supposed to do something serious here, aren't we? I, I don't know. So you served on the Court of Appeal for over 27 years. Yeah. You authored over 250 published opinions, right. and you reviewed thousands of civil and criminal appeals and writs. Mm -hmm. True. Um, there's so many significant cases that you authored. I mean, one that I always uh, uh, look to for guidance when I'm doing dependency work is In re Bailey, uh, which is at 189 Calap 4th, 1308, discussing the hybrid standard of review mm -hmm. when you're applying the beneficial parent-child relationship exception. Uh, that uh -huh. that uh -huh. one case uh -huh. has been cited in over 900 cases uh. in at least 14 published opinions and was recently cited by the California Supreme Court in May of this year. So My that's just goodness. one of the wow. amazingly helpful contributions mm. to the development mm. of the law mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that, you, uh, that you made. Are there other cases that come to mm -hmm. mind that mm -hmm. are significant or that are near and dear to your heart that you'd like <laughs> to share with us? Well, they're all, all my children, you know. <laughs> they're a product of a lot of work. Uh, and uh, that Bailey J case, I think it was. Yes. Was it 19, oh, when was it? 2010? 2010. 2010? Yes. Wow. Was a long time ago. Um, it's a really good example, if I'm recalling this case correctly, of there being a disagreement in the, in the appellate courts about what standard of review to apply. Should we apply a deferential substantial evidence review or is this going to be abuse of discretion, I believe, it was the split. And um, we concluded that analytically uh, they both apply, I think. Uh, substantial, and this has to do with uh, when adoption is, is, uh, is the preferred uh, approach in these dependency cases and that there are exceptions to that, and there's a mother uh, or a parental exception, and there's a sibling exception. There are. And, and I think that, uh, I'm kind of glad you brought that case up because um, it's not something that most people would be familiar with unless you're working in juvenile dependency law, right? But it's a really good example of courts of appeal reasonably disagreeing about what standard or review to apply, you know. Uh, room for discussion on both sides. And, um, and I think that's helpful for a jurist to keep in mind at the Court of Appeal level, even at the su Superior Court of Trial level, that, you know, when you're dealing with the law, 
Okay, there's going to be disagreement as to what the standard is or what uh, substantive law might be applicable or how you interpret a statute. And, and both, uh, both takes can be grounded on rationale, good rationale. Um, and the trick is, which one should it be? You know, and that's where courts of appeal come in, where the Supreme Court comes in. Um, that Bailey J case is actually a good example of looking carefully at what the trial court's responsibility is. Then once you figure out what the responsibility is, then you can decide what standard should apply in terms of reviewing at the court of appeal level, right? A judge's ultimate decision, either to grant the exception or not to grant the exception. Right? Adoption should be adoption or no adoption because we have these special relationships, right? And so when you, at our level then, um, and, and you were always so wonderful, can I just say this? So wonderful about bringing my feet back down on the ground and saying, okay, this is lovely. How can we help the trial court <laughs> figure out what they're supposed to do? <laughs> Early on, I remember, we had these discussions, and even later on in my career, we'd have these, wouldn't we, Patty? We said, is this gonna be helpful? Is this clear enough? So that if we were in the trial court, we'd say, either, this is so clear, I understand exactly what I'm supposed to do, okay? Or, what in the world are they talking about? <laughs> I have no idea, you know, how to, how to handle this, you know? So, um, yeah, that's a really good example of looking at the analytics from the standpoint of what would be helpful to the trial court. In that case, when you're, when you're figuring out, first of all, whether there was a relationship, a significant relationship, that's a factual finding. You look at what's going on, right, with the parent-child or the sibling, sibling situation. And then beyond that, once you figure that out, then there's the broader question of, so is that enough? Is it a compelling reason not to uh, uphold the adoption rule or order of the court? And that's a discretionary call. So as you, I think I'm getting this right, what happened was we said both apply, depending on where you're analyzing this. You know, you first analyze substantial evidence and you analyze it uh, for discretion, uh, abuse of discretion. And uh, yeah, I'm, I had no idea that case was <laughs> out there in, ter in terms of its impact on the ju uh, judicial system. Such an important case yeah, in dependency yeah. law and provides clear mm -hmm. guidelines to uh -huh. the trial court mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. provides clear guidelines to the appellate mm -hmm. courts in terms of our review. It's one of the mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. that will um, live on uh, mm -hmm. and be part of your legacy. Oh my goodness, my legacy. <laughs> Oh wait, that's what we're doing, right? That's <laughs> right. We're doing the legacy <laughs> interviews. So David, don't so, laugh. It's not funny. So this, is, this is serious business. <laughs> in addition, in addition. To David, by the way, is our cameraman. You can't yeah. see him, but he's such a nice fellow. <laughs> he's got this really lovely mask. I mean, it looks like the, a United Nations flag display or something. I don't know what that is. It's colorful and it's lovely, and, and then his his partner over there, Chris. I mean, he's a jewel. We love you, Chris. Wake up, Chris. Wake. Are you awake? <laughs> Nick, would you make sure that he stays? Nick is our bailiff, our, our, our wonderful CHP fellow. Now, he's appropriately wearing a black mask, right? Because he has to look serious and mean and, you know, things under control. So in addition... Oh, I'm sorry. This is not going to be edited, but, you know, <laughs> do we care? No. <laughs> so let's just jump back to the Court of Appeal here. In addition okay, to... if you insist... <laughs> The cases that you worked on, you also were very involved in judicial administration. That's true. Served on many, many committees. You mm -hmm. did lots and lots of work to improve um, the judicial system and to help litigants. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about your involvement on judicial uh, committees and bar committees? Yeah, I don't know how that started exactly. I think uh, once you're on the bench at the Court of Appeal level, um, Judicial Council and those committees are always looking for people who are going to bring some expertise and some uh, skill sets uh, to the table to help them, whatever it is. And there are dozens and dozens of committees, of course. There's court interpreters, right? Budget committees, uh, rules committees, and so forth. Uh, small claims, uh, civil, civil committees, criminal. Um, and so uh, early on, I was serving on the Appellate Courts Committee. Uh, for judicial counsel, and uh, I think Gary Strankman was he uh, the one 
uh, who's chairing that from the first. And I think uh, that our, our charge was to investigate how we could make our appellate system more efficient, all right? Especially in times of tight budgets. And it all has to do with budget, right? And so um, I was asked to serve with, um, I can't remember who the other appellate justice was. We went to Fresno, we went to LA. So we're in the fifth district and we were, went down to the second appellate district, which is daunting. That, that district is huge, as you know. You know, eight divisions, you know, tons of uh, jurists and uh, everyone has got an opinion about something. So, but we did it and we, we came up with a report. Um, the other committee I served on uh, for some time, probably 11 years, I want to say, something like that, was the what's called ADOAC, the Appellate Indigent Defense uh, Oversight uh, Committee. And um, the last three or four years or so, I was the chair of that committee. And basically, that committee was uh, charged with the responsibility of auditing uh, claims made by uh, attorneys representing indigent defendants on appeal and making sure that uh, those claims uh, were appropriate, uh, accurate, and so forth. And so uh, that was, a, that was a, a tough committee to be on because uh, every, um, every quarter we would get, you know, 12 to 14 cases, appellate cases with full records, um, in terms of briefing at least. Um, of course, there are, there are claim forms, and we had to do a lot of checking to make sure everything was appropriate. And then we'd have to write a report. We'd have two-day meetings in San Francisco once a quarter. And, uh, but I have to tell you something about this committee. It was filled with really uh, engaged and highly competent, experienced jurists. And we have uh, appellate project directors there who uh, would manage and oversee and train uh, appellate lawyers in, in their work so they can um, fulfill the uh, requirements of the Sixth Amendment, uh, represent the right to counsel. Uh, and we, of course, had eight, uh, JCC staff there, judicial counsel staff, which, who are wonderful. So it was a real pleasure being on that committee. And as chair, I, I began to realize how important that committee was even more so. Um, yeah, so I, I did that. Mm -hmm. So I know you served on the appellate court, the task force on appellate court process, mm -hmm, the appellate mm -hmm. court advisory committee, right. the legislative subcommittee, and right. then of course the appellate indigent defense oversight advisory committee, uh -huh. which required hours and hours and hours of work and tremendous leadership by you mm -hmm. and Thank was you. appreciated by everyone statewide because mm -hmm. that's such an important um, assignment. Mm -hmm. You also were a member and past president of the California Asian Pacific American Judges Association, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the California Judges Association, the Santa Clara County Bar Association's Minority Access Committee, <laughs> the Appellate Courts Committee, where we co-chaired uh -huh. many, many programs. Uh -huh. For the county. Right. For the county, yeah, and right. the Law-Related Education Committee. Uh -huh. You also served as president of the Sentencing Alternatives Program of San Jose. Right and uh, dedicated many, many hours to uh, judicial and legal um, committees. Uh -huh. um, while you were working on your thousands of uh, civil and criminal appeals and writs. Mm -hmm. So for 27 years, um, you dedicated yourself to the work of the Court of Appeal as well as um, dedicated yourself to improving our justice system. What observations do you have? What, um, what thoughts do you have? Um, and then what motivated you to think about retiring? Like you, were ha you had a wonderful career. We had a tremendous, um, uh, we have tremendous colleagues we were working with. You and I were working together. And then all of a sudden you made the decision to retire. So what observations do you have about that whole that whole period, and then oh. what mo what made you decide it was time to retire? Oh, goodness gracious. Um, the first question had to do with my observations about my committee work and that sort of thing. And your work on the court. And, and my work on the court as well. I really enjoyed uh, my committee work, obviously, and, you know, um, and, I, and I certainly enjoyed working here. Oh, my goodness. It, it was, this, this is a dream job. This is a dream job, especially as an associate justice. I remember when Chris Cottle, our dear friend who's now retired, became the uh, administrative presiding judge of our court. He got a call from the administrative presiding justice in San Diego at that time, Dan Kramer, who I knew, 
a former AG. And Dan calls Chris and he says, congratulations on being appointed uh, to the uh, administrative presiding justice position. And Chris says, well, thank you, Dan. He says, you now have the second best job on the Court of Appeal. <laughs> and I thought to myself, that is so true. I had the best job at the Court of Appeal being an associate justice. I got to work with wonderful people. I got to take on challenging cases, interesting issues. Uh, I got to write, you know, and I, and I love writing, and I, and I love reading cases and so forth. So it, it, uh, it kind of came full circle, you know, uh, in, in, this, in this particular job. And, uh, and everyone here, uh, from the justices, uh, support staff, you know, the clerical's office, clerk's office, uh, uh, or even our uh, IT people, you know, uh, just delightful to work with. And, and that makes the difference, the people you work with, you know. The people um, uh, aren't uh, what you would hope. Uh, it's, a different, it's a different world. But our people here have been fantastic. 27 years is a long time. Um, you asked, so what made me retire or what was my thinking? Uh, it was a long process, you know. I, in fact, Probably 10 years ago, I was going to retirement judges' uh, conference meetings just to hear what they were talking about. And all of my colleagues say, you're not thinking of retiring, are you? I said, well, no, I'm just exploring, you know. Um, but some of the more memorable things, the input that I got from people in terms of when to retire and when that should happen, uh, my, my friend uh, down in uh, um, uh, the second appellate district, um, Steve Suzukawa, who retired at age 60. I thought, wow, that's early, you know. He had his 20 years in, and he said, oh, I'm hanging it up. I called him, I said, what's going on with you? You're so young, you're retiring at age 60. What? I said, I, uh, do you like the, don't like the work? He said, I love the work. Well, your staff, are they giving you problems? You know, your lawyer's staff, no, they're terrific, they're smart, they write well, they're beautiful people. J.A., your judicial assistant, is that, it? no, 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 no. Terrific, terrific, all the way down the line. Your colleagues, okay, it must be your colleagues. No, they're, they're fantastic too, wonderful people. Is it health? No. Um, so why are you retiring? Silence. And he says to me, Nate, he says, look, you can have all these wonderful things going on at the Court of Appeal. And I love my job. I love the people I work with. But in the final analysis, the final analysis, Nate I said, yeah, still work. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> he just got tired of working. I mean, that, that's, and he wanted to do some other things too. But uh, that made me laugh. I thought, okay, that's one perspective. The second perspective, uh, and, and this was actually more helpful than anything, is that I, was, I can't remember if I was talking to somebody, if this is anecdotal, or I was actually talking to someone. It was a appellate, uh, appellate justice was telling me this. He said that his father was a judge. And when he was getting close to what he considered retirement age, he asked his dad, so dad, what goes into this calculus in terms of retirement? How, how do you figure that out? And he said, son, this is my advice. You'll just know. I thought, what? <laughs> That's it? You'll just know? But you know something? He was right. You just sort of know in your gut it's time to say, we're we're." We're shutting the door on this chapter and moving on to something else. So I think that was the most helpful to me. And uh, sure, I had my list, pros and cons and that sort of thing. But um, part of it, too, uh, in terms of the, the hard facts, is that, you know, uh, I wanted to uh, enjoy my retirement with my wife, still be healthy enough to do that. Uh, I wanted to do some more teaching at Santa Clara University Law School. I was actually invited to Davis uh, to teach at Davis as well. Um, so I had those opportunities, um, and I thought I would uh, have more time, obviously, for my students, because you know, you know, I mentor a lot of students. Well, that was going to be my next question. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so, finish your answer, but I want to ask you about your many, many, many years of mentoring so many law students and young lawyers. So mm. you wanted more time to spend with your students. Yes, I, I did. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time with them anyway, you know, because I had this. Uh, judicial expert program that I started, I can't remember, 2010, I want to say, 11, something like that. And um, in the past, I had a smattering of students working for me, but there was no program. So I developed this program, uh, and uh, it kind of grew. 
At first it was a joint program with Superior Court. Uh, they would have them for six weeks and I would have them for six weeks. And we would flip. Um, but I actually started this program where I would give them appellate cases that were in the process of being completed or just beginning uh, to, to uh, be worked on. And the reason why I did that is because my lawyers would be familiar with the record and the briefing, and I would too. And so it wasn't reinventing the wheel. I never gave them anything new. My staff questioned that. They said, you know, are you sure they're going to want to do that? I said, they're going to eat it up. It's going to be easier on us. And so um, I actually shared that with the chief, and she got really excited about it, and uh, all of the justices at the uh, Third Appellate District in Sacramento. But uh, in any event, uh, when this thing started, uh, it was a joint program, and then we added the Supreme Court. Ming Chin was working with me, and so he would take one of my students. Um, and that, and so that's how it morphed. And then at some point, I can't remember when it was, maybe f four or five years ago, I decided, well, um, this is a little like herding cats, you know, just too many moving parts with all these other justices and all, so judges. And so I broke out on my own. And of course, we have a joint program. I had about a dozen students every summer. And I would take a couple, maybe two, three, during the academic year. Um, but on my own program, I would take up anywhere from, from uh, four, to, four to seven students, as you know. And uh, they would work for me and, and, and write up uh, opinions and attend oral arguments. And uh, they're also delightful. And uh, they would do uh, evaluations for me. Sometimes they would just write me thank you notes. And uh, it was just gratifying to see them grow from that first day they darken the door here till the time they leave. Uh, they're different. Their perspective is different. Their attitude toward the law is different. The level of excitement is heightened. Uh, they're more anxious to get back into it, you know, uh, at law school. So, um, yeah, that's it's very rewarding. And then, part of the mentorship uh, also has to do with my faith. Um, and uh, I guess we can talk about that at some point. But I, but I do speak a lot to students on campuses. You know, uh, either making presentations uh, on law um, or or appellate practice, uh, doing moot courts and that sort of thing. Or I'm I'm talking to these. Uh, these other students about their their uh, their faith and, and how that impacts law school and beyond. So I know that throughout your entire judicial career, you mm -hmm. have mentored law students and young lawyers. You have, you have always had flocks of law students <laughs> following you down the hallways and <laughs> sitting in oral argument. Right. You've set up programs where we would meet with the That's right. uh, students in the courtroom after right. oral argument mm -hmm. and discuss best practices and brief writing and right. um, oral argument. Um, you have impacted the lives of so many of our uh, lawyers. Uh, I know you've performed their wedding ceremonies. <laughs> yeah, I know you've that. encouraged them uh, mm -hmm. in their careers. And I know you want to stay active in uh, teaching and mentoring. I also know that faith is very important mm -hmm. to you. And mm -hmm. so can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about uh, the importance uh, of your faith and the intersection of your mm -hmm. faith and the law mm -hmm. and its impact on your judicial career? Uh -huh. Sure. Uh, that's. Uh that's easy. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm a Protestant Christian, you know, been since I was 10, um, kind of floundering around trying to find my way as, as, as most young people are and, and do, and still am to a degree. So you, know, you never really arrive. But my faith is important to me because it kind of grounds me. And um, in law school, uh, that was important because that's such a challenging experience. And I remember when I became a judge, it was even more terrifying because I, of course, I've never been a judge before, and it was a, a whole new, new arena for me. And I remember Marilyn Morgan, who was the uh, president of the County Bar Association at the time, just a, a lovely person and, and so supportive and kind and smart, and uh, later became a bankruptcy referee, as I recall, in Santa Clara County. She came up to me at my investiture when I was being sworn in, and she shared something with me. It was very interesting. Because I don't really talk about my faith that much, you know, honestly, to people, unless they ask. I, I'm not someone out there who's going to uh, stand up on a soapbox. I, that's just not my personality and my temperament. I don't do that. But uh, Marilyn came up to me, and it was very interesting. She said, uh, you know, Judge, I know you're a man of faith. And I'd only been on the bench, you know, some months. You know, and I said, okay, all right. <laughs> and then she said, there's a judge um, 
I'm trying to remember his name now, uh, who in our Superior Court is now retired. And he had this, uh, this Bible verse on his uh, desk, and it's from uh, the book of Micah, chapter 6, verse 8. And, uh, and the verse reads, and I had never heard this before. She says, the verse reads, Oh man, you know what God expects of you, right? To do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. And that just knocked my socks off. I thought, wow, wow. Um, and I thought, that's so amazing that she would share that with me. And I expressed my appreciation for that. But it started me off on the right track because that was going to be something I would aspire to throughout my entire judicial career from day one then, you see. From the day I was swearing into the municipal court at an investiture, of course, which is a couple of years after my actual uh, swearing in. But uh, from that point on, uh, that would be my, uh, my goal. Do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God. So, um, so um, how do I put this? Um, so my faith has had an impact on my work because it's impacted me here you know, the, uh, the outflow of that, of course, is in, in my work, you know. Uh, a good example of that, it's something we talked about. Remember you and I and Justice Corrigan at the Supreme Court attended the, uh, the faith conference, the interfaith conference in Sacramento, uh, sponsored by the Sacramento Bar Association and the Superior Court there. Um, and uh, I, I remember it was uh, held, held at, a, at, a, at a Muslim uh, house of worship, and just so delightful, you know, and to meet all these people from the other faiths. and and with the same goal, to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly. And so, um, and uh, I remember uh, how enjoyable it was to be on a panel with you and Carol and, uh, and so forth. But it, it made me realize um, that we do, it does have an impact on us, you know, faith, uh, or what we believe is another way of putting it, I guess. But for me, that uh, became really clear in that uh, one juvenile case we had, remember, uh, in Ray G.Y., I think it was called? about this kid who, when he was a teenager, he, he, uh, he held a gun to someone at their home. I, it was, I think he felt that he, they owed him some money or something, and uh, he was convicted. Uh, he was put on probation, served out his probationary period, went to work for his parents at a printing shop or something. And then he goes to the United States Army and really distinguishes himself. A couple of tours of duty in the Middle East, you know, he's highly decorated. He comes out of that a changed person completely, right? He comes back and he does two things. He, one, he gets his felony reduced to a misdemeanor. The second thing that happened is that he petitions the court, I'm giving this, to seal his records, his juvenile records, right? And the Superior Court judge, rightfully and correctly, says, I can't do that. You're convicted of a, uh, possessing a firearm, using a firearm. He says, you know, the law doesn't allow for that. And here's the person who's completely changed his life since, since he was under 18, and, and the law is forbidding the trial court, the discretionary authority, to, in an appropriate case, to grant relief. So it came up to us on appeal. It was my case. You were on it. And I remember we were racking our brains, weren't we? Is there some way we can see the legislature maybe creating an opening here and this and the language of the statute was ironclad there was just no way around it and i thought no we got to follow the law so that's what we did we followed the law and we affirmed the trial court's decision not to grant relief but in the first paragraph of my opinion as i recall it, i said this is wrong we invite the legislature to correct this and you wrote an amazing concurring opinion uh, as i recall supporting that uh, the decision, of course, but also supporting the notion or, or the thought that we got to have the legislature take a look at this. And then I can't remember how long it was after that that you were at a trustees meeting at St. Francis High School, which I think you were on the board there, and some, a woman came up to you and said, I'm the mother of this uh, fellow that had appealed this case, and I uh, just want you to know the legislature has just uh, passed and the governor signed uh, into law an amendment to allow for the... Uh, um, the sealing of the records in, in, in extraordinary cases. And, ah, oh, wasn't that a great moment? And we shared that at that faith conference, I remember. We did, we and did. People were applauding and cheering. I thought, you know, where does that come from? Because you and I know, at the Court of Appeal level, we could just said, yeah, 
this is a slam dunk affirm. You know, we're done. Where, we, where should we have lunch? We didn't do that. We labored over that because it was an unfair result. We followed the law, which we have to do. We have to follow the rule of law, right? We did that, but it didn't prevent us from inviting the legislature to take a second look. And that's where what, faith comes in, my faith, your faith, the notion that we can do better, you know? We can think outside the box, you know? We can do things that impact people, you know, outside the context of our, quote, expected roles as judicial officers, right? Uh, I just gave two keynote speeches, one for the uh, UC Davis um, uh, Asia Pacific Law Students Association and the second one for the Santa Clara. Uh, it's encouraging them to do the same thing. Think outside the box. Don't think, just think of your role as a lawyer as doing X, Y, Z in terms of following the rule of law, which you must in applying it. But think of ways you can do more, do more, so. So Nate, let's talk a little bit about your family, your sure. wife, how uh -huh. you met her, your son Jonathan and um, his beautiful family. Oh, Can yeah. you share with us a little bit about them? Sure, uh, I'd be glad to. Um, I might, met my wife through uh, mutual friends and um, uh, through church. And uh, I remember I was at a potluck <laughs> and she was there. I, I thought she was the sister of the hostess and that was wrong. Um, so I thought that she was from Chicago and she was, <laughs> she was local which I was happy to hear about. But um, she did ask, she's so funny, my, my wife's so honest, she says, so, as we go to the same church, she says, so, you're in law school? I said, uh-huh. She goes, so, how can, can you be a lawyer and a Christian at the same time? <laughs> and I said, okay, well, I'm gonna go get an hors d'oeuvre. And so that was kind of the end of that conversation. You know? <laughs> but fortunately, she, she put up with my bad sense of humor and, and, uh, and we started dating and one thing led to So we got married in 1979 when I was at the AG's office um, and all my friends were there from, the, from work and that was delightful. And so we've been married 41, 42 years in July. It'll be 42 years. Um, and then we had a son, Jonathan, uh, who's now 37. He's married, got married a couple years ago. Uh, to Kristen, who's delightful. Um, Interestingly, uh, Kristen's from Benicia, and she's the next door neighbor. Uh, her family uh, uh, is next door neighbors to uh, uh, Jim Lambden from the first <laughs> district. So Jim calls me from time to time and says, I think we're neighbors in law. So I said, okay, <laughs> whatever, Jim. <laughs> but uh, no, and Kristen has a delightful family, and uh, we're all close. Uh, she has a younger sister. and. Uh, but she, so she and Jonathan have been married a couple of years, and they're expecting their first child in, um, in five days. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So day after tomorrow, my wife and I are throwing the sleeping bags in the car and heading to L.A. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, uh, and we'll be uh, anxiously uh, awaiting the birth of our, uh, our little grandson. So, um, it's a yeah. very exciting time for yeah. your family. Yeah, we're, we're, we're thrilled. We're really thrilled. Um, so that's... Uh, yeah, and then I, as I said, my brother's in Half Moon Bay and uh, happily married. And uh, ha you know, uh, his wife's name is Susan. My wife's name is Suzanne. And it's kind of odd, uh, a coincidence. And uh, their daughter Annika, as I was mentioning, is in Pepperdine, and, and she's really a, a peach, just uh, terrific. So uh, I have great family, a um, lot of relatives, of course, as you do, uh, throughout the Bay Area and Southern California. So uh, yeah, we all try to keep in touch. Mm -hmm. I know your family is very important to you, and Truly. I know your faith is very important mm -hmm. to you, too. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on the arrival of your new grandson yeah, this week. We'll be very up. excited yeah. for you and the family yeah, and looking you. forward to many, many wonderful years yeah, with thank your family. You. Um, thank you. So let's move on to talk about... Um, what makes a great lawyer and what makes a great judge? I mean, you uh -huh. were a lawyer, you were a judge, you were a justice, you had many, many hundreds, if not thousands of lawyers appearing in front of you. You mm -hmm. worked with mm -hmm. um, colleagues in the municipal superior courts. And then of course, we worked together in panels of three in the appellate court. So what are the great qualities of mm -hmm. an outstanding lawyer? Mm -hmm. what, what do you look for in a lawyer, first sure. of all? Sure. Um, I can give you the short answer. Um, 
the long answer, of course, is you're looking for people who are diligent, who really care about the law, uh, who walk with integrity, you know, uh, uh, who are thorough, um, who, who represent themselves well. Um, one of the largest complaints I remember reading uh, about lawyers, um, this is years ago in the State Bar Journal, they did a survey of clients and asked, what's the most difficult thing about your relationship with lawyers? And, and the number one complaint is lack of communication. My lawyer doesn't return my calls, doesn't explain to me, things to me very clearly. Uh, I think what makes a solid lawyer uh, are those traits and, and, and that manner of uh, dealing with your, your clients. Uh, of course, uh, knowledge of the law is, is, is really paramount. You have to know what the law is. And, uh, but communication, I think, is really important also. Um, in terms of my singular answer, um, I remember uh, giving a presentation uh, at Berkeley Law, now then called Bolt. I was coming down Brancroft Avenue, going to my car, and this student comes running up to me it says, Justice Mihara, I'm so sorry I missed your lecture. Oh, I, I, I'm so sorry. I had a conflict with the class, and I'm sorry I couldn't make it. And I said, well, that's okay. That's all right. And she said, you know, I'm graduating in a couple of months. Do you think you could give me a piece of advice, maybe just one thing? It's probably hard just to say one thing, but if you could just give me one piece of advice uh, to kind of launch me into my legal career. I said, she says, that's probably impossible, right? I goes, no, it's not. She goes, not? Said, no, it's easy. Well, what is it? Said, well, tell the truth. She said, what? I said, tell the truth. <laughs> I said, look, let me explain it. I said, whatever you take away with you from law school here and in your life, I said, there's one thing you need to really firmly grasp and engage with, with all your heart, with all your might, all your strength and mind, is the truth. To tell, be committed to the truth. To tell the truth, speak the truth, Listen for the truth, encourage others to speak the truth, okay? Whatever it takes. It doesn't matter if it's a legal truth, a factual truth, historical truth, scientific truth. It doesn't matter. Ethical truth, that's got to be your commitment. You know? She says, wow, no one's ever said that to me before. Well, now you've heard it. <laughs> Blessings. <laughs> Have a great day. So that was your advice. Mm -hmm to lawyers, mm -hmm. and now let's talk about judges sure. and justices. What mm -hmm. makes an outstanding judge or justice? Mm -hmm. You know, that's also um, easily answered. Um, I'll give you the short version, okay, because I think we all know what really good judges are, right? Um, they, uh, they listen carefully to the evidence. They, they're patient. Uh, they have great temperament, right? They know the law inside out and backwards, you know? and uh, they engage appropriately, right? Uh, they don't abuse their authority, you know? Um, so yeah, they can control proceedings. They, they, and they're always educating themselves and training, re rethinking things, you know, to make themselves better. I was at a, uh, in Los Angeles uh, at a, I think it was a CGA event where they had a special session. It was a three-day session um, by invitation and I applied and got in. It was about a dozen of us. And the title of the, the program was called Excellence in Judging. How do you become an excellent judge? Not just a good judge or a very good judge. What are the goals? What are the things that we can do to become excellent at what we do? And which is always my goal. I, I just want to get better and better. Um, and I think a lot of us do, of course. But uh, we met for three days. We read treatises, we read articles, we talked, uh, we looked at case studies. At the end of the day, at the last day, uh, on butcher paper, the, the leaders and the organizers wrote out all of our suggestions and our ideas that we accumulated over the week in terms of what makes an excellent judge, right? And the question that, that was posed to us was, look, what is the one thing that all of these elements have in common? Look around the room. And we did. And then it hit us like a landslide. It was, what is it? All of these elements are relational. They are all relational. I thought, wow. That's the common denominator, relationships. Okay? So if you want to become an excellent judge, 
you focus on the tasks and the duties, of course, that you're expected to do, but over and above that, you do the things that what? Enhance relationships, right? You make those connections with people to help them become better at what they do, or maybe how they're feeling about things, or their perspective on things to improve that, you know? That kicks it up a notch as, uh, was it Emeril Lagasse? Bam, you know, we're gonna kick it up a notch. You know, that's what you do as a jurist. You're not just content for the eight to five and going through the routine and, you know, you're always looking for ways of helping people improve themselves and yourself, of course, relationally. Yeah. And so is that the advice that you would give to judges and justices? Yes. Yes, I would. I, I, would, I, would, I would think, try to think relationally. Um, and the same advice that I gave to the lawyers as well is that make sure you're committed to the truth. Don't fudge. Don't stray into that gray area and say, oh, it's okay. Even in terms of your work ethic, you know, the thing that would really gets me is when someone says, well, that's good enough. That's good enough. I got that from actually from my, my, my second or third year on the job here. Uh, I had invited some students who were talking about the various cases we were working on. And uh, I said, well, you know, um, what are we looking for? It was a question. Well, we're looking to get it right. We're looking to uh, have a good, solid opinion. Uh, I don't know. There, there are times when maybe um, there are things that you can't, can't um, accomplish, maybe because of time or whatever, and other things. And, and Martha, <laughs> my lead attorney, says, Excuse me, Judge, can I just say something? Something you told us actually a while ago. I said, What? He says, We're trying to be perfect. <laughs> my goodness gracious. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and she's right. I mean, that's what I would preach. I would say, Look, you know, we've got to get it right. And, and what does that mean? It means we've got to try our best to be perfect, right? Because in, in these, giving these keynote speeches and I talk about the truth, you know, the question is, so Mihar, where do you get this stuff? Let's think about the truth. Where, where does that come from? And when I tell the students, and I've told lawyers this and, 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 and my fellow judges as well, well, it comes from our preamble of our United States Constitution. We all know it. We, the people of the United States, in order to what? Form a perfect union. Form a more perfect union. You going to do that without the truth? I don't think so. The very next thing you know, that we should be committed to is the next goal that's stated of the six is what? Establish justice. Can you do that without the truth? No. A snowball would have a better chance of surviving the Sahara than, than establishing justice. And the clincher, um, and this is what I, I, I hope I, I, I leave my students with, especially in, in the young lawyers I talk to, is that, you know, the goal of all this is to what? It's the very last line. It actually, the preamble is one sentence in the 55 words. But the last goal, the objective, and the motivator is what? To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Without the truth, it's not happening. You know, we live in a very divided country now. It's splintered in so many directions. But to secure the blessings of liberty, no, as envisioned by our founding fathers, the way that happens is it starts with the truth. Yeah, that's where it starts, you see. Because a lot of people confuse that. They say, well, you know, and this is what I would say to the judges, you know, because in our judicial questionnaires that we have to fill out, you know, for application for judgeship, it says, you know, what's your reputation for honesty and integrity? Those two concepts are conflated so much, and it bothers me, because they're different. Honesty is telling the truth, okay, and it's critically important. Integrity you know, if you want know, to talk about excellence in terms of the judiciary, integrity is another ball game. Truth and honesty are subsumed in that, but integrity is something far more important. Why is that? Because that has to do with the whole person. It's not, are you honest? It's, are you honest and are you reliable? Are you trustworthy? If you can look at yourself in the mirror and say, okay, the day I had today, um, I was trustworthy. Yeah. Then you're talking about 
your A game. So that's your advice to lawyers and judges. Right. And so um, in the 35 years of judicial experience that you've had, you've always helped people become better. You've always helped them try to improve. Mm -hmm. And I know during your retirement years that you'll continue your teaching and mentoring. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us what else you're doing um, during oh. retirement? Oh, sure, sure. Um, well, yes, in addition to the teaching and the mentoring, um, I, uh, I've joined uh, ADR Services alternative dispute resolution services and uh, they're privately held and operated um, and uh, uh, Lucy Barron is the uh, president uh, and uh, her daughter Joanna is a uh, uh, VP and I and I went with them for two reasons uh, two main reasons one is that I wanted to keep involved with the law in some fashion but I didn't want to become a, a pro tem doing what I did before sitting on the bench wearing a robe, you know, making calls, although it's very important to me and it was, it's been great. I feel like I, I could have a bigger impact on the legal community doing this other kind of work, which is, um, <laughs> if you will, being a judicial peacemaker, okay? When students and even lawyers or lay people ask me, so what is the law all about anyway? Why do we have all these laws? You know, what's the big deal? I said, well, my concept of the law is very simple, and maybe too simple, but it's basically to create order out of conflict. That's what we're trying to accomplish. And, and that's been my goal all along, okay? Whether it's discussion at the Court of Appeal level, trying to resolve a case, or trying to settle a family law dispute in Superior Court, you know, try to help a young couple who, who've broken off their engagement and helping them divide up their property, well, no, that, those are my CDs. Oh, that's my ironing board. You know, whatever it is to help create order out of chaos, to resolve conflict, I mean, that's what we do. And what a better way to do that is than as a mediator, an arbitrator, as a neutral, a judicial neutral. Um, so it was to kind of stay involved at that level and at, and a, at a legal level as well. So uh, it might involve some research and understanding what the law is and, and so forth. The other aspect of it is that I didn't want to do it full time, and this particular group, this uh, um, this company, uh, says, "Judge, your time is your own. An hour a week, two hours a week, forty hours a week—it's up to you." And I really appreciated that. They gave me a lot of flexibility because I know, in my heart, I want to be with students, young lawyers, teaching, whatever, visiting colleges and you, you know, law schools. You want to continue your work with your students right. and. Um, uh, continue your work as a mentor, but you also want to continue to be a judicial peacemaker. Exactly right. Exactly right. And so I have a few closing questions for you. Sure. Um, the first one is, how would you describe your contributions to society, legal history, and the development of the law? Uh, <laughs> I read that question and I thought, oh my goodness gracious. Um, Dave's behind the camera going, we don't have enough time. And Chris is saying, I really want to go to lunch. <laughs> we're, almost, we're almost there. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Chris, OK? Can I just say that? We love you. And, and Nick, too. He's treating you, by the way. I, no, I'm at Chris. You're treating him. I'm, I'm sorry, Nick. I just, uh, what was the question again? <laughs> How would you describe your contributions to society, legal history, and the development of the law? Describe my contributions. Well, I thought a lot about that. I think I just want to leave that up to other people to figure that out. Um, like you brought up the the Bailey J case. My goodness, I haven't thought about that in ten years. You know. I think of you every time oh, I read that yeah, case, wow. every dependency case where wow. there's the exception. I'm, I'm so touched by that. Really, I uh, yeah, I really am. But. But that's what I'm getting at. I think in terms of my legacy, in terms of the law and the imprint I've made on the law, the legal landscape and history and so forth, that will be manifest by the people who read my work, who use the work, right, the opinions that I've written, uh, or refer to it uh, in a scholarly fashion or, or academic, if not in, in a court of law. Uh, that's where the legacy will be. I can't 
see all of that happening, and so it's hard for me to kind of gauge that. All I can tell you is that, you know, when I hear from people, oh my gosh, that was a great opinion. I really enjoyed that opinion, and, I, and I've been using it. Uh, that's the feedback that I get, but I, that's not true in every case, you know. Um, so I think I'm going to leave my legacy reputation up to those who are impacted by it. So what contributions and achievements are you most proud of? No, that's also a really great question. Um, I don't, uh, I'm not fond of the word pride. It's just not part of my lexicon. I don't, um, I use it a lot with my son. <laughs> I'm so proud of you for doing that. Okay, and he understands where that's coming from because it's personal, he, he understands my heart on that. But, um, or family, when I'm talking about my family. But um, the things that I am proud of in terms of what I've done or accomplished, um, that's just not part of my DNA. I don't, I don't think in those terms. What I will say is I'm, I'm satisfied and I'm gratified by the work that we've produced proud of it, that's kind of at a pretty high level. I, I have to say that, um, yeah, I guess I could say I'm, I'm proud of my work. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because I don't think there, I can think of a case where I slacked off, where I didn't give it my best. It may not be, in another person's point of view or perspective, the best work, uh, and, and that's okay. I mean, but on the other hand, you know, I want that person and others to know that whatever I produced out there in terms of written opinions or oral decisions, that I gave it my best shot. I gave it my A game. It's like my son walking off the field at Bellarmine in his last football game. Dad, I gave it my all. I left myself out there. There's nothing left. That's how I feel about these cases, okay? And so when you say most proud of, um, here's what I want to say about that, that four-letter word. Uh, I'm not most proud of anything. Uh, that I've done. I, what I am, um, what I can say is that, and this is what I tell my lawyers, or even my externs that work on cases for me uh, in the past, I said, I want you to bring your A-game, okay? And I don't want you to ever have this feeling that this case is more important than this case, right? I want you to bring your best to the table, regardless if you're dealing with a huge corporation or the little guy on the street. It doesn't matter to me. Like in Muni Court, it didn't matter to me if it was a small claims case versus what I was doing in Superior Court, you know, doing these multi-million dollar uh, cases in, in involving uh, corporate transactions and that sort of thing, or, or personal injury cases, you know. Um, I just, I, this, again, it wasn't part of my mind. I was concerned about the law, the application of the law, the application of law to the facts, uh, achieving it, not just a just result, and to say, is it a fair result? Well, fairness is, depends on the eye of the beholder, right? So in, in my view, was it the right result, you know, based on proper legal analysis, right? Reason, the voice of reason, you know? Um, that's, that's what you try to achieve, right? And, and to uh, look at the kinds of work that comes into us as something being of a higher importance than something else is, Again, it's something I, I really fought against. Um, the exception to that, of course, would be something that we're mandated to do. For example, juvenile cases take high priority. CEQA, or California Environmental Quality Act, cases take a high priority, right? Criminal take high priority. Civil cases, similar. But that's in, ter that's in terms of how we, when we deal with it. Not how we deal with it, but when we deal with it, okay? So, um, yeah, that's kind of a long, <laughs> I thought that was going to be a short answer. I wasn't sorry. I'm sorry. But that's my take on it. So my final question mm -hmm. is, I would like to invite you to make any closing comments or share any thoughts with us oh. um, that um, you would like to share. Mm -hmm. Right. The dreaded final comment question. The dreaded most egregious question for the end. Um, I'm teasing you, of course. See, I can do that because we've known each other for, gosh. Many years. Me way many too long. Many years. Way too long. Um, okay, here's what I would say about that. Um, I feel this uh, tremendous sense of gratitude, you know, uh, for my, my judicial career. 
Um, yeah, uh, of course, the family, first and foremost, to God, to God, first and foremost, for giving me these opportunities that I never sought out. I never wanted to do this, you know. Uh, it was kind of, I wouldn't say forced upon me exactly, because I, I did sign up. But, um, but I'm very grateful for the opportunity uh, to create a better world. Yeah. Grateful God, family, and my colleagues like you. Goodness gracious, you kept me afloat for so many years, you know, just, oh, I'm so discouraged about this. Oh, come on, you know. What was the favorite expression of my staff? Have a donut. So my day would become better, brighter, happier, glazed, of course. But the, the, the whole idea that you can uh, come into a work situation and make somebody's life better, this is an interesting thing. Uh, I had a, I had a, a friend who considered me a, 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 we went to law school together. His son became a lawyer, went to UCLA. And David called me and said, Judge, would you talk to me? Uh, I've I got some issues at work, and he's working for a big firm in Palo Alto, civil law. I said, sure, David. So we had coffee. He says, I don't know, I, I just don't seem to be on track, and I'm, I'm having difficulties my second year as an associate. And he was telling me of the problems he was having with support staff. And so I shared something with him. I said, look, this is what I tell my staff when I get a new, new staff member, central staff or whatever. This is what I tell them. I said, you've got your responsibilities, okay? Reading the briefs, writing draft opinions, you know, doing the research, reading the records. Here's my responsibility to you, okay? And this is very serious, I said. The first thing, and I've mentioned this before, but the first thing I think you should know is that my goal is to put you in the best position to bring your A game, okay? Whatever that takes. So you need to talk to me, okay? And we need to talk to each other to make that happen. All right, that's number one. Number two, and this is equally important to me, is that I have a responsibility, me personally, as your supervisor, as your leader, to be thankful to thank you for the job that you're doing, okay? That's, my, that's on me, okay? And if I fail to do that, that's on me, okay? But I just want you to know that's my goal. <laughs> I'm not gonna be perfect at it, but I'm gonna try really, really hard to make that happen, all right? Okay. So, in terms of my, my thoughts about the court, my relationships with people here, it's that I hope I, I uh, accomplish that. I, you were talking about making people's lives better. I think there's a lot of ways of doing that, right? You help them do a, um, a great job, of course, but you also try to just make their day happier, you know? It's just giving them some jelly beans, a donut, whatever it takes, you know? A limerick, you know? Um, or helping with something more substantive. Uh, that, that's all part of the, the process here, but... Uh, that was, was, was so enjoyable here is that, you know, I was, I came away every day thinking, wow, so glad I was here, so glad I'm here. And I have great friends who invite me to your birthday party celebrations, you know. I got my retirement book and it has Ray Younger, our, one of our staff attorneys, has that great photo of me apparently holding, holding one of your UCLA bears and it looks like I'm asleep, but I, I, I think he just caught me at a bad, awkward moment. But he said, you know, Justin Manukian's chambers get awfully hot, and, and Justin Pihar loves pastries, and he probably had a little too much to eat, and he was kind of, you know, I was kind of cringing about that, but I thought, oh, that's okay. <laughs> Patty's a friend. <laughs> but I miss your birthday parties that you'd have for the staff, and uh, I, miss, I miss your staff dearly. Yeah. We'll keep inviting you. Oh, would we'll you? We'll keep inviting you. When this COVID thing's sure. off, boy, I'm, you know, I'm putting more parking uh, money in the meter, by the way, <laughs> next time, because you know, I, I can't miss out on these desserts. <laughs> well, Justice right. Mahara, thank you so much for sharing your personal and professional journey mm. with us today. Yeah. I wish you great happiness and good health in retirement. I wish you. you wonderful moments with your family and blessings always. Mm -hmm. It has been a great blessing to be your friend and colleague. I miss you and I'm grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you, Patty.